My favourite zombie movie is Shaun of the Dead, but that's not very scary. My favourite scary zombie movie is 28 Days Later, or is it 28 Weeks Later? It's definitely one of these, and I'm here today to decide once and for all by going through each of the movies. And along the way, we're going to dig up some facts about these movies so we can appreciate them in different ways. For example, did you know that 28 Days Later was deliberately filmed using old cameras? This is because Danny Boyle wanted the movie to feel raw and authentic. This creative choice personally hits close to home, as I grew up in a time where everything you watched was terrible quality. And the movie in general has a rough feeling about it. This rough quality comes with some jarring elements that could be criticised. <laughs> Wait, did that zombie just speak? <laughs> But the overall charm of this movie definitely overcompensates for its flaws. We're going to go through the story of the first movie before we then cover the sequel 28 weeks later. And I've seen an IMDb, they're actually working on 28 months later. So as long as I'm not dead by the time that movie comes out, I'll be covering it for sure. Now, before we continue, let's address me calling the infected zombies. I know they're not technically zombies, but the movies are assigned to the zombie genre. You can't sit there and tell me you're going to go to your local CEX and ask to be directed to the infected section, because if you're at the front desk of the CEX asking that question, you've already found the infected section. But for real, just know that when I say zombie, it's to make my life easier. I haven't got the best voice and I do battle with some speech impediments. So for me, it feels more natural to say I was being chased by a zombie rather than I was being chased by an infected. Just doesn't really flow as nice, does it? So if you're good with that, let's begin. The rage virus all began with a few monkeys being drugged and tested and also forced to watch the worst of humanity, such as rioting, blood and death, and the real housewives of Atlanta. A combination so deadly, it infects the blood of the monkeys. Some animal rights people break in to release the monkeys and they fail to listen to the scientist when he tells them, the chimps are infected. They're they're highly contagious. They've been given an inhibitor. Infected with the... what? Rage. Stop! Stop! You've no idea! <laughs> ah! So the message of this movie is Peter calls the apocalypse. 28 days later. The world outside of this movie is introduced to Killian Murphy, an actor deliberately chosen because he was pretty much unknown. This makes it easier for the audience to connect with the protagonist as a human, rather than a famous actor playing a role. So, how was he introduced to the world? Full length nude body shot including penis and balls. Killian Murphy's character in this movie is Jim, a guy who wakes up in hospital after being in a coma, completely unaware of the rage epidemic that spread across the UK. So he walks around London screaming, Hello! It's impressive to me when a disaster movie is able to be shot in the middle of a capital city. They had to shoot these scenes really early in the morning so they could avoid capturing the general public walking about. We turned up very, very early in the morning. We had a lot of cameras, digital cameras, because we were able to use a lot of them, so that we could capture enough material in two minutes of the traffic being held back. Because even at that time of the morning, and even with a lot of traffic marshals, who were usually very pretty girls that we sent out to ask motorists to wait, please, even then you only get two minutes of tolerance from people before they go, oh no, God, I'm going to go to work. Ah! And it seems to me they nailed every shot, mostly. There's a little guy walking here. But still, pretty damn good job. Jim wanders into a church in the hopes of finding people, and he does, a whole room full of them. But oh dear, it appears they're dead. Hello? Well, this zombie looks ready to eat. He's already wearing a napkin. <laughs> This moment of horror is an example of a jump scare done right. It's not just some cheap loud trick to make the audience piss their seats like so many horror movies do these days. So Jim runs away in a confused panic and he then bumps into some people who save him from the infected. And these people take him into a nearby news agents where they explain that everyone Jim knew is probably dead. I've got some bad news. Here you go, mate. Have some Maltesers to ease the pain. They agree to take him to his parents' house just to check if they're definitely dead. 
Yeah, they're pretty dead. They stay the night in Jim's house, and the transition to night is shown in this cool double exposure shot. This is an example of one of those harsh looking creative choices I mentioned earlier, and it does add to the special quality of this movie. Jim, in his naivety to the new world, watches a home video which grabs the attention of an unknown passerby. I remember this scene being the one that scared me the most as a kid. I didn't want to be near any windows that night after watching this. Luckily Jim avoids being bitten, but the same can't be said for whatever this guy's name is. Mark? Wait. This lady here remains in the story however, and her name is Serena. Serena and Jim wander off in search of a new place to rest, and they notice some Christmas lights on a distant block of flats. They make their way up the stairs to see if anyone is home, when all of a sudden... Quiet! That's infected. He was being quiet. You on the other hand were shouting the word quiet. He did have a can of tango somewhere. Quiet! That's infected. When they reach the top, they're intercepted by a man wearing a riot shield. Down the corridor, flat 157. Thank you. After that, he kindly welcomes these two strangers into his home, where he lives with his terrible actor daughter. And anyway, it isn't true what Dad said. You need us just the same as we need you. This hospitable fellow is called Frank. Everyone likes Frank. Frank offers you a place to stay with full use of his facilities, and he offers you a disgusting looking green drink as a welcome present. As lovely as this place is, they're running very low on water, so they need to find a place they can all go to together. Frank's been listening to a radio broadcast where some military camp claims they have the answer to infection. They bicker back and forth about the pros and cons of going, and this is where the terrible kid actor Hannah comes along with some stale delivery. And we'll never be safe in the cities. The soldiers could keep us safe. I know I shouldn't be too mean, she's young, but come on. Tell me that didn't sound unnatural. The soldiers could keep us safe. So off they go to find the military base, and it's not long before they run into their first obstacle. A sensible man like Jim has the idea to go around, but lovable meatheads like Frank here think it's much better to go over the rusty, jagged scrap heap of cars full of broken glass and sharp metal. Oh, you got a puncture, eh? Who could have foreseen that possibility? Naturally, this was like ringing the dinner bell for nearby zombies, and they all come flooding in. Get the tire on! Oh, right. Get it on! Hannah, on, come on! One, two, one! Drop it! <laughs> all this running makes our gang hungry, so they stop by a budgins to go shopping. Seems remarkably stocked for a shop during a national epidemic. Yeah, I think I feel confident calling this scenario absolute bullshit, especially now that I've lived through a global pandemic in the real world. Between this scene and the next, we get a bizarre transition insert shot of their cab driving by a painted field. Why did Danny Boyle include this shot? I have no bloody idea. We never see this stylistic choice come back in another scene, so it's just kind of a jarring insert. Talking about things that don't fit, in the next scene, Jim encounters a young zombie boy, and this happens. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, that was one of the infected speaking, and it's the only time in either of these movies that we hear an infected speak. And to make it weirder, Jim decides not to mention the fact he just heard one of the infected speak when he gets back in the cab. Find anything? Find anything, Jim. No, let's get out of here. Don't you think that's kind of an important thing to bring up? Yeah, it's just a sign of intelligence, but I'm gonna ignore that. Anything happen in there, Jim? Nah. Apparently, the commentary track for this movie says that this was an audio mishap, which I can see as being legit, but for me, this still alters my experience of the movie, because now I believe the other infected have the ability to speak, but they never do. <laughs> Eventually, the gang reach a blockade, which is where the military said to go. They hop out and take a look around. 
Frank then observes a peckish crow feasting on a dead zombie. He goes to spook off the crow, but it drops some infected blood into his eyeball. And we all know what's coming next. Dad, are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine, sweetheart. Keep away from me! Dad! Keep away from me! Keep away from me! Keep away from me! Jim! Jim is infected! No! no! Before Jim has the chance to kill Frank, the military swoop in and do it for him. Keep away from my body! Dad? In this scene, we see a few seconds of a cameraman in the shot which I never noticed before. And this is because naturally your focus will be over here looking at Frank. Now that you've seen this, there's no unseeing it. So you're welcome. Also, I can't neglect to highlight some more terrible acting. Dad? Dad, are you perhaps dead after being shot a million times? Dad? The film continues in a new location, this mansion turned military base, a place which seems quite secure, but within the first night of the gang's arrival, This lets you know that nowhere is truly safe. Safety can't even be found inside of the mansion, especially if you're a woman or a female child. It's only been a month and you're already this animalistic and bloodthirsty for sex. Jesus Christ, I hope there's no animals nearby. They're probably fair game too in your eyes. When Jim learns of the soldier's intentions for the females, he tries to rush them out of the house to escape, but then boot to the snoot and lights out. Jim and a fellow objector to this mating plan are marched at gunpoint to a quiet place in the forest, and somehow these trained soldiers manage to cock up the execution, allowing Jim to slip away. Relax. He's over the wall. He's got no vehicle and no shooter. He's dead. Further showcasing their inadequacy, these supposedly trained soldiers are then outsmarted and overpowered by a shirtless Jim, who lures them out to the blockade using an air raid siren. Jim uses the cover of the gathering infected to slip away from the action, so he can get back to the house and break down their operation. Jim's first action is to shoot the chains holding down this ex-soldier infected guy, which is a great plan to get the others in the house killed. <laughs> But I think this is a little reckless considering his friends are in that same house too. Jim then watches through a window looking down at all the chaos where the soldiers get picked off one by one. And there's one scene from this sequence that sticks in my memory where Hannah's holding on to the back of the mirror hiding from one of the infected. Well, she can't act, but she sure can hang on to a mirror good. The actual interesting part of this scene is seeing one of the infected observe itself in the mirror. It shows intelligence exists enough to be self-aware, maybe. There's nothing more scary to me than a zombie with the ability to think. Jim eventually saves the day slash night by going animal style on the last remaining soldier. This gives us a clever parallel between the rage of man and the rage virus. Yes, yes, what a marvellous display. The movie ends with the same word we came in on. And overall, I had an amazing time watching 28 Days Later again. Waltz and all. Dad? Juan Carlos Fresnadillo is a director no one's heard of, except for Danny Boyle, who liked one of his movies that no one's ever heard of. And when I think about 28 weeks later, especially the first 10 minutes, it confuses me as to why we haven't seen more of this guy. 28 weeks later when compared to 28 days later, cost more to make and didn't make as much back. So maybe that's why? At the start of this video, I said I would once and for all determine which of these movies is my favourite. And after watching them both again, I can tell you right now that it's 28 days later. Because despite 28 weeks later having a way bigger budget and more Hollywood appeal, I Holly wouldn't consider it to be as great as the first. And to explain why, we're now going to go through this movie too. 
In an uncommon move for a sequel, we've moved away from the previous protagonist, Jim, but in his place we have the amazing actor Robert Carlyle, and he's hiding out in this cottage type place with his wife. His name is Don, her name is Alice, and their kids aren't here because they got deported to somewhere safe, giving these two lovebirds some privacy for kissy time. Not interrupting, am I? It won't be long till another kid crashes the party, however. That very same evening, some screaming boy is trying to get into the house, and he's making all sorts of unnerving commotion outside. And you know this boy's arrival is going to bring trouble. When this boy comes inside, one of the fellow house dwellers goes to check what's happening outside. I liked how quickly this movie reminds you that nowhere is truly safe. It only takes one tiny slip up, or in this case one noisy little nuisance, to transform your safe house into just a regular open door house. Don is then faced with a scenario where he can either run for his life or attempt at a slim chance of saving his wife. Don! Help us! Love you, bye. This is where we see Don running for his life in the movie's most memorable scene. The building intensity where more and more zombies enter the frame, combined with the most intense score in zombie movie history, and the overall frantic display in performance and editing, all of this is just incredible. The signature difference between these actors acting as classic zombies and acting as an infected person is seen in the way they run. Most of these guys are trained acrobats or theatre people, and they've all been specifically coached to run not like a monster, but like a person with rage. This guy here was a movement advisor for this movie. That's a real person that was involved in the movie. So just remember kids, the world is your oyster. You can literally be whatever you want to be in this life. With Don sailing away, he looks back in guilt knowing he left his wife to die. Or to come back later in the movie maybe. I don't know, let's just wait and see. The movie tells us the stages of London's slow recovery, to the point where Britain can finally welcome back the people who evacuated. Despite this repaired state, the fear of infection still lingers. We've got heavy military presence on rooftops, and a major who is overseeing the return of the people who lived here. No one told me that we're now admitting children. Now, if Britain was truly safe, would it really matter that kids are coming back too? This movie has a similar casting principle to the first movie. In present day, we know this major character is played by Rose Byrne, and the main soldier guy is Jeremy Renner. But back in 2007, these actors weren't really known for much at all. And that also includes Idris Elba. He plays the army general who's trying to convince Rose Byrne that Britain is much safer than she thinks. What are you afraid of? What if it comes back? It won't come back. What if it does? If it comes back, we kill it. Don gets reunited with his kids in London, and we get to see how life is starting to return to normal. People are given new jobs to do and new places to stay. And all of this is not really a stage we get to see when it comes to disaster movies, because the fun part, of course, is watching it all fall down. And yeah, I suppose watching them rebuild is interesting, but it's not that interesting. It's not 28 Days Later interesting. It only takes the movie about 10 minutes from this point, however, to kick it up a gear, and we get to move into the interesting stuff again. Don's two kids, whose names I don't care to look up, have snuck off to go visit their old home. Something of which is forbidden because it's outside of the safety zone, and our soldier on watch Jeremy Renner takes no prisoners. <coughs> nah, can you imagine? Nameless Boy ventures upstairs to go see his old room, and instead sees someone is hiding. Personally, I would have soiled myself and ran as fast as possible in the opposite direction. But to Nameless Kid here, this is no ordinary weird stranger, it's his mum. Don's very much alive wife. I mean, we're trapped. Trapped in the bedroom. I've seen them. Painting. I couldn't do anything. You're a liar! You're a liar! You know something that you're not telling us, you slimy scumbag liar! Murderer! 
You got away with murder, you murdering lying waste of life! Tell us what you know, you goddamn liar! The military arrive and take away their mum because they want to give her a nice relaxing shower and then to also give her some very reasonable questions. Can you tell me anything about how you managed to keep alive while you were gone so long? <sighs> okay, annoying movie cliche time. I really can't stand it when they write a character to be silent during questioning. I feel like they only write a character to be silent during questioning when the answers to those questions would poke holes in logic. Have you come into direct contact with the infected? <laughs> Good question. For another time. Roseburn examines her blood and discovers she does carry the infection, but somehow she's not affected by it. A good question. For another time. When Idris Elba hears of this, he makes a beeline to go and kill her before she starts infecting someone else. But he better hurry because Don is in the room kissing her to say sorry. And I'll give this movie some credit for having the balls to essentially kill off the protagonist and then even more alarmingly to then make him one of the movie's villains. You don't really get to see that kind of bold shift in movies. But having these bold moves in your movies does have its consequences which we'll discover later. Idris Elba calls for Code Red as Don spreads the infection to other soldiers. In a state of Code Red, the best strategic move to contain the infection is to lock down the affected buildings. And too bad for anyone who happens to still be inside that building, which in this case includes Don's children. Mass panic breaks out as Don smashes his way into the dimly lit room where all the people are being held in lockdown. I feel like this scene has the potential to be much scarier than it is, but because everything is so frantic, my brain almost had a meltdown trying to deal with the shaky visuals and general craziness. And I know that's kind of the point, that's what's supposed to happen, you're supposed to be put into the shoes of panic mode, just like these people here, but it's still difficult as an audience member to be equally as scared as you are confused. The confusion aspect definitely outweighs the horror for me. And to top it off, the person we're supposed to care about in this scene is Don's nameless boy. But we've barely got to know this lad, so do I really care if he lives or dies? No, not really. We've already lost our protagonist and I thought that guy was going to be the one we cared about throughout the whole movie. So right now I'm just feeling a little lost. This is just Don's kid. We, we don't know this guy. We get another interesting slice of action watching the military as they try and scope out the infected from the panic crowd. They quickly realise however that it's almost impossible to tell the difference. So the only effective cause of action here is to kill anyone that moves. Abandon selective targeting. Shoot everything. Targets are now free. We've lost control. This is where the movie's protagonist shifts to Jeremy Renner who is just following orders when he shoots everyone on sight, including the nameless kid. Nah, got you again. It's Jeremy Renner. He's a good guy who does good things like saving kids. So of course he's now going to make it his mission to track down Nameless Boy and protect him. Nameless Boy is hiding out with Nameless Sister and she's the first one to show some emotion, crying at the news of her dad basically dying. Unlike Nameless Boy here, he looks about as upset as someone who wasn't able to catch their favourite Pokemon. It's because of this distinct difference in their reaction, the nameless girl will now be named Imogen Poots because that's the actor's name and I like saying the word Poots. It's fun to say Poots. Jeremy tries to escort Imogen Poots, Nameless Boy and some other tagalongs to safety. But then Jeremy receives word from his helicopter friend that the entire sector he's in is about to be firebombed. But if he can get everyone to a nearby park, helicopter friend will wait there and pick them up. Despite Idris Elba's firebomb plan, a pack of the infected escaped the blast zone and that's because we still have about 20 minutes of movie left. We can't have 20 minutes of movie without the infected involved, come on. Despite the almost countless routes the infected could have taken, they somehow ended up running down the exact same route as our survivors. How unfortunate. 
When helicopter friend goes to land, he argues with Jeremy about the amount of people he can take, leading to one desperate survivor to jump the queue. Hey! Get the fuck off here! What follows is another chaotic sequence of cuts, both in editing and in helicopter blades. Yeah, I admit, this is pretty fun to watch. Well, anyway, they're on the run again, heading towards a stadium, because Helicopter Friend is giving Jeremy one more pickup chance before he abandons them forever. They then run into a wall of gas, just to add to their list of problems. So they jump into a Volvo, because Volvos are well known for being airtight chambers. Get the bits, get the bits. Oh no, no wait, the gas is coming in. But that's okay, they can cover their mouths with t-shirt material. Yeah, they should all be dead right now, but we do still have 15 minutes left. Jeremy can't get the car started and they need to move soon because on top of the infected problem and the gas problem, they now have flame troopers closing in to torch the place down. And this is where Jeremy sacrifices himself to get the car going. Go! Freeze frame. This is the exact moment where I can highlight the one reason that makes me prefer 28 days later to 28 weeks later. We have now lost two protagonists in one movie. If you want me to carry on caring about your movie, you're going to have to give me someone within that movie to care about. These two kids haven't been important enough for me to really care about so far. And yeah, it was hinted at earlier that these kids might hold the cure to infection because their mum was bitten and clearly immune to it, so maybe they are too. But they never mention this again, and the kids haven't really been a focus point of the movie at all, so why should I care about them surviving? Compare this to 28 Days Later, we followed one man's story and his survival was dependent on the support from side characters, who we care about because they were important to the story. The more we got to see of these people, the more we cared about them. Mostly. Dad? Familiarity keeps you caring, and at this point in 28 Weeks Later, I just don't care. I'm sorry movie, I tried. To top off this feeling, I'm then frustrated by the following scene, where Rose Byrne is with the kids heading through a pitch black subway. Now, I want you to watch this short clip and tell me what you think is wrong here. Okay, get back, get back, just stand in the wall. Okay, okay. good. Just stay close, slightly to the right, Andy. A, stop bloody shouting. Are you aware of how far your voice is carrying right now? B, shouldn't you be in front, Roseburn, considering you're the only one who can see where you're going? If you were leading the pack, you could just hold their hand and guide them rather than screaming commands at them. And C, you're aiming a loaded rifle at kids while you're on high alert, and you could easily pull the trigger at any moment. What are you doing? Stop! 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 Right now! Naturally, they run into the only infected person we're familiar with, Don. And Don breaks up their merry band, killing off Rose Byrne and then turning his attention to Nameless Boy. No! No! Oh, what a shame. Imogen Poots takes him out, but it's too late. The boy is already bitten. Maybe he'll turn, maybe he's immune. Either way, Imogen Poots ensures he gets to the helicopter friend who picks them up and flies them all the way to Paris. This is the end of the story of 28 weeks later. And so now we're left with the burning question. With 28 months being in pre-production, where could the story go from here? Well, I would very much like to see this scaled back again. I think we've gone too big. The charm of 28 Days Later was that it felt personal. He was only following a couple of characters to really care about. So what I think they could do is they could take the infection out to sea. How cool would it be to see a close quarters fight for survival on a cargo ship? There's nowhere to run, you've only got a few people on board, and filming a zombie genre movie out at sea is something which I don't think has happened before. So that right there is a unique opportunity, Mr. Danny Boyle, because I'm, sure I'm sure you're watching this right now, Mr. Danny Boyle, take some notes. And also, Mr. Danny Boyle, I love your movie 28 Days Later. Much more than 28 weeks later. Sorry, Juan. But I do have one request. If you happen to be involved in the next movie, please help settle the debate. Can the infected speak? Yes or no? I hate you! <laughs>
Well, well, well. I loved sharing my thoughts on these two movies. I hope you took something away from this experience too. Please consider leaving me a like when you're done or maybe just watch another video of mine.